Welcome one and all to worship on this Palm Sunday evening or whenever you might be um, participating in the service this evening. My name is Heidi Koscheck and I'm the ordained minister at Gordon United Church and we're located in Langford, BC, which is on the edge of Victoria on beautiful Vancouver Island. And uh, we're at 935 Goldstream Avenue if you ever want to join us in person when you're able to do so. I'm really pleased to welcome you all to this worship, and I wanted to extend a special welcome to members of the 2LGBQS+, sorry, I think I left out some letters there, to all of you in the queer community who um, may not always be safe in Christian communities, and so we're glad that you found us here online and that you're able to participate and feed your faith in this particular way. We as a congregation are working towards full inclusion. We are already as a church uh, affirming of folks in the queer community, but we're working towards broadening that and deepening that so that folks can really feel safe and welcome among us. I also wanted to take note of the fact that I live and work on the unceded territories of the Lekwungen people here on Southern Vancouver Island. And I am an inheritor of the legacy of residential schools and colonization. As a Christian and as a person of European descent, I'm a first generation Canadian. My parents were both immigrants. I've lived all over Canada and I consider myself a sojourner uh, in this territory and a guest. And I know that there is a shared history of pain and suffering uh, with the Indigenous people right across Canada and that I have a responsibility to learn about that, to tell the story and to work in concrete ways towards reconciliation and I invite you to join in that journey with me. As a light the candle of Christ today, perhaps you have a candle or a lamp or even a flashlight in your home or wherever you are watching this that you would like to light to symbolize the presence of Jesus the Christ here with us as we worship. So as I light the candle, let's just take a moment to breathe deeply of the spirit of life as we listen to music that celebrates the creator. God is so good and count your blessings played by Tim Olford.
We count our blessings as we move into prayer. Father, Son, Spirit, as we mark this day when Jesus rode into Jerusalem, we sing your praises, just as the crowd sang and shouted that day. We pray that we might never cease to give thanks for the gift of the Christ's presence, for your teachings, your witness, your promise of abundant life. As we walk through this day of celebration into a week of remembering the danger and the death that awaited you, Rabbi Jesus, we pray that we might never turn away from the suffering of others, that we might never see violence as in any way redemptive, that we might always turn toward the other with compassion and mercy, knowing that we are all flawed and fallible and that we are all forgiven and blessed. Amen. I apologize for the light today. Um, I'm having to adjust the light a little bit in the place because the light is beautifully streaming in the window. And if I have the light coming in the window, then you get a glare on this side of my face. And if I shut the blinds, then you get more light on the other side of my face. So um, either way, it's not very good. But anyway, we continue. Um, I'm going to read you the account of Palm Sunday from the Gospel according to Mark. Mark tells Jesus' story in the shortest form. And so it's sometimes the one that I choose when I'm trying to keep the services to a reasonable length. But I'd encourage you to read the Palm Sunday story in the other Gospels, Matthew, Luke, and John, and just see how it's told a little bit differently in each one. Jesus' triumphal entry into Ju Jerusalem, Mark 11, 1 to 11. When Jesus and the disciples were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, enter it you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say this, the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here immediately. So they went away and they found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest! Then he entered to Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the 12. We thank God for this reading from Holy Scripture. And we're going to sing a little bit of the story now by singing the hymn, Hosanna, loud Hosanna. And I thank you, uh, thank the Congregation and Choir of Ebenezer United Church for this recording.
Somehow, Palm Sunday doesn't seem quite complete when we don't sing that one. Now, as I think of the procession um, going into Jerusalem that day, I can't help thinking of how the people of Jerusalem welcomed Jesus as their savior, as their liberator, and the parallels with how the Russian army thought they were going to be welcomed by the Ukrainians when they invaded the country. That might seem like a strange connection to you, but it came to me immediately on reading this story. The Russian army was told that they would be hailed as saviors, that they were freeing the people from neo-Nazi domination. They were told that they'd be greeted with flowers and food and praise and the red carpet would be rolled out for them. They were told that they would roll down the streets and folks would be waving and cheering just as they did for Jesus. They were told in a sense that they too were on an anointed mission. They too were messiahs. There is a religious aspect to the war currently happening in Ukraine that many have overlooked. Kyiv is historically the center of the Orthodox Church in that part of the world. And Putin sees himself as the great uniter of the broken Orthodox Church not, I think, out of any sort of religious fervor, but out of a need to dominate. He understands the symbolism of entering Kiev in procession. He understands himself to be not just reuniting a secular empire, but also a sacred one. He wants to ride into Kiev the way that Jesus rode into Jerusalem, but without any sort of tragic aftermath for himself. He wants to be the savior and unifier of the Russian Orthodox Church, never mind what the Ukrainian Orthodox, Orthodox Church has to say about it. He wants to be Emperor Constantine, uniting a divided church and bringing it all under his dominion. Jesus of Nazareth was a humble leader who would ultimately reject lordship and denomination because he would not enact the violence that is necessary to conquer and subdue the enemy. Putin's vision is one backed by the military and by the threat of the deadliest technology known to human beings, like Pilate and Caesar and all the other so-called saviors who bring death instead of healing and life. The plight of the Ukrainians is very much on my mind, as I know it is for many, if not all of you. But also the Syrians who have pretty much been abandoned to their fate. Afghanis who are hunted by the Taliban for their support of the West. Rohingya who cannot return to their homes in Myanmar. Ethiopians and Eritreans who have fled war. And yes, even the Russian soldiers themselves many of them young conscripts doing their military service who may die in a foreign country or find themselves unable to return home because they refused to fight a war that they didn't believe in. The trauma of all those who have lost any hope of home, the trauma of those who've witnessed atrocities committed by others, perhaps out of hate, perhaps out of the kind of numbness and dehumanization that happens during war. Well, no matter how wars turn out, those people will bear terrible scars, regardless of whether they are on the winning side or not. I came across a poem for Good Friday 
And it brought to mind the pain of all the mothers and fathers and friends who've watched the people they love suffer because we humans keep turning to violence to get what we want, to silence those whose voices we don't want to hear, to keep our own power and privilege, or to interrupt those who want to claim more than their share of the resources we have. We turn to violence because we know no better way to cope with the extremities of human behavior. There's always a price, a price that's paid as much if not more by the innocent than by the guilty. And yet even the guilty have those who would grieve for them. So I share with you this poem written by the Russian poet Anna Akhmatova, who lost her husband, her son and her lover to the Russian Revolution and the Russian state. She lived from 1889 to 1966. For many Russians, she's come to represent the Russia that once was. The poem is called Crucifixion. Weep not for me, mother. In the grave, I have life. The choir of angels glorified the great hour. The heavens melted in flames. He said to his father, why hast thou forsaken me? And to his mother, oh, weep not for me. Mary Magdalene smote her breast and wept. The disciple whom he loved turned to stone. But where the mother stood in silence, nobody even dared look. Just as we observe the celebratory spirit of a Palm Sunday, we recognize that it's just one act in a more complex story. I know that many of us would much rather skip from here to the Easter Alleluia's, but there's somewhere else we must journey before we reach Easter morning. We walk through controversies in the temple, plotting and planning between friends and enemies. We sit at a table sharing a blessed meal and discovered that betrayal is right there at the table with us. We walk and rest in a garden with soldiers on their way. We hear from a distance rumors of an illegal trial and stand in a crowd as people shout for our teacher's death. And finally, we stand helpless, stunned once more by the violence that exists in our world. We look, but not for long, lest our hearts be stricken by the sight of a mother weeping, of the world we know bruised and broken, shattered into pieces like the body of Jesus on the cross. The world we live in is not so different from Jesus' world. Into violence and oppression, he brought healing and proclaimed liberty. Into religious rigidity and self-protection, he brought a spirit of freedom and inclusion. Into a society where the wealthy had far too much and the poor had very little, he brought the call to generosity and to self-giving. He lived for this. He died for this. And he holds out hope that the powers that oppose the ways that he taught and lived will not dominate forever. But that is a story for another day. Ride on, ride on in majesty.
Let us pray. God, our Savior, we put our ultimate trust in you alone, as we know that you have given your whole self for us in Jesus. As our hosannas turn to sorrow at the violence of Jesus' time and of ours, we pray that we might truly be channels of your peace to bring love where there is hatred, pardon where there is injury, healing where there are wounds, peace where there is conflict. We pray in silence for our relationships, our community, and this whole battered and beautiful world. This day is the anniversary of the Battle of Vimy Ridge. We hold in our hearts that piece of our own Canadian history. And we pray for the memory of those who served and died, those who served and were wounded, those who served and survived, but bore inner scars, scars that continued to live in generations that came after. Oh God, we know all too well the price of war and the difficulty of building lasting peace. May your spirit move in all people to bring peace to our planet. We thank you for the moments we have of peace, beauty and joy in the midst of the heavier parts of our life, and we thank you for the way they renew our hope. We know that we are a part of your intention for the universe, that we each have a part to play in creating a world where human beings no longer inflict suffering on one another, but instead live in harmony with all that is. We will continue to dream this dream with you. For it is not impossible when your spirit is at work with us and through us and beyond us, moving into the farthest edges of the universe and the deepest, most hidden places in the human heart. We commend our lives and our world to you now as we come to the end of another day. Bless our rest and strengthen us in your service, O God of all. Amen. So friends, as we leave this time of worship, may the prayer of the children, which you'll soon hear, a prayer that we've been singing and dancing to in church on Sunday morning, be a prayer that carries with you into the coming week so that the world might indeed be blessed with peace. Amen. Amen.